Hello and welcome to another sales chat. My name is John Golden from Pipeliner Sales, uh, Pipeliner CRM and Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. And today I'm actually, for once, I can say I'm in the same city as my colleague Martha. We're both here in lovely Vienna, Austria. Today's a kind of nice day. Last few days have been a beautiful city, but pretty cold, right, Martha? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and and we're delighted to be joined by Rob Jollis, in, uh, who is in Washington, D.C., in uh, in the Maryland area, actually. So how are you today, Rob? Good? Oh, I'm great. We, we've had our own weather here on the east coast of uh, the United States, so we've just dodged a pretty big storm and uh, you know, on the first day of spring, but uh, we're ready to roll. Excellent. And Rob, uh, as those of you who are familiar with sales, Pop will have seen before, is a much sought after speaker, best selling author. Uh, he's, as we were just talking before we went on air, he's been around the world, uh, I don't know, a number of times, um, spoken everywhere, uh, giving keynotes. But he has an interesting book coming out, um, I think, uh, later this year, correct, Rob? Yeah, October 2nd. Yeah. And it's a book about, you know, why exactly do people not believe us? And you're talking about this in a sales context, right? And yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to get right into it. But for anybody who's listening live, there's a Twitter chat. So if you want to get involved in this uh, discussion, I really encourage that you do. Just use the hashtag sales chats. Martha is there. She monitors the Twitter feed. So she'll be answering back and forth. And if you if there's a particular question or, or insight you have and she thinks it's uh, pertinent to what Rob and I are talking about. She'll interrupt us and tell us about it. But so without any further ado, uh, Rob, why did you write a book called Why Exactly Do People Not Believe Us? And why don't they? Yeah. Okay. So let's break that down. Why yeah. did I and why don't they? Yeah. Um, I actually uh, really got this idea and this concept, not from the sales community. I've been volunteering for six years to help uh, people who are um, in career transition. Right. And uh, some, sometimes they're kind of beat up a little bit emotionally. Mm -hmm. they, they lose their confidence. And um, so I was working in a Petri dish in a sense for six years of people that, feel, that are struggling to be believed. And, um, and, and so uh, I began, I put a program together and my first program five years ago, we took a dozen people who were unemployed for a minimum of two years. So wow. we're talking about a chronic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, half the room was unemployed for five years. And we went through this program and within uh, 60 days, 10 of the 12 had been hired. Wow. And, uh, it, it, and then I began to kind of branch out and say, well, now, wait a second. This isn't just for people who are unemployed. Many people, particularly in sales, let's get three bad rejections in a row. Right. Shoulders go down, our tone begins to change, head goes down, and we kind of walk in going, in a sense, um, you're not going to buy from me, but let's have a <laughs> chat anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's get to the, so so I began to think, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on the words. Here's what to say. Here's your with them. Here's your elevator pitch. Here's, but we don't spend time on the tune. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's the tune that betrays us. So let's get to the second part of your right. question. You know, why exactly don't people believe us? In one sentence frequently, because we don't believe us. Right, right. And yeah. people feel it and see it and sense it. We don't think it, but we just, it's like a musical note that goes flat. And we're delivering the same life flat. And we're practicing our words more flat. And that's one of the key reasons. So what you're saying, and it's interesting what you say about uh, about working with the unemployed people, because I mean, you would say somebody out of work for five years, chronically unemployed, you know, maybe even at that point, start believing that they're unemployable, right? Because they've been that long out of the workforce. Uh, and so what you're saying is you just dis you discovered from that work that um, you really do project what you're feeling inside as opposed to what you're saying. And then from a salesperson point of view, if if I've had a few rejections in a row and I come into you, Rob, and I say, hey, Rob, uh, I know you're going to love this product. And in my head, I'm going, Rob, you're going to hate this. You're going to hate me. You're going to hate this product. <laughs> so how do you start as a as a salesperson? How do you start to overcome that maybe that little voice in your head? Let's make sure we believe mm -hmm. us. 
And, and that means we have to believe in our product. Right. I know we've learned that in the past, but we can never underestimate the damage of the lack of belief in our own solution can, can cause. Mm -hmm. So let's check that box for now. Right. And I make the assumption that one, I really believe in my product. Mm -hmm. And two, I'm feeling pretty good about me. Right. That's where I usually jump in with salespeople. So I get to your question, which is, all right, go on step one, inside. Let's talk about outside. Well, I think a lot of people, reason why salespeople kind of, you know, get into this fear is because uh, in a sense, we pursue perfection. I, I think that in a sense, we're, we're, we're running after the wrong solution there. We don't need to be perfect. Perfect. As a matter of fact, people can't identify with perfection. Mm -hmm. They identify with imperfection. Right. So I think one of the things we a fear is we have to be perfect. And I want people to understand, not only do you not have to be perfect, but it's been written by a few different people. We all have a limp. We all <laughs> have a limp. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes that's a stutter, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just a subtlety. And we carry that limp, and we're very concerned that people will notice that limp. Sure, sure. I want to embrace that limp. I want people to understand that the only the only way that limp will hold you back is if the client thinks you're being held back. Right. And then they get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But nobody's all that concerned with a limp with, well, I don't have this natural energy, or I don't look like this stereotype. Fine, if it isn't a problem for you, it won't be a problem for the client. Right. So, it, you know, there's, we have to, you know, keep an eye on that. And one last thing, it's, it's just, it's a quote I actually keep by my coffee bar, but you can bet it's in the book. And because look, uh, was it Dean Smith once said, uh, you know, you can't approach every situation as a life or death situation because to begin with, you're going to be dead a lot. Okay. <laughs> and in sales, we're, one day we win, one day we lose. One day we win, one day we lose. Mm -hmm. If we can't stomach it, we become an accountant. I mean, <laughs> we have to understand that. But sometimes we take a couple losses in a row, right? So yeah. here's the quote I have by the coffee bar. Worry is the misuse of your imagination. Uh, very good. And when I coach people, when I work with people, what I want to help them with is uh, we get past that limp, we ease up on the, we got to be perfect, and then last, we don't misuse our imagination. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, imagine if we could imagine for a second, you had 10 straight calls or appointments. All of them went amazing. Each one loved you more than the next. What do you think you're going to look like on the 11th one? And <laughs> the, the opposite is true. We're running real well. All of a sudden, bang, we lose. Bang, we lose. Lose a few more. Okay. Then we start to worry. Then we start to focus on our limp. Then we be maybe it's our age, maybe it's our <laughs> hair. We don't know. So we got to pay attention to all that. We do that. And uh, funny thing is, another quote that I happen to love, <clears throat> which is, "The body doesn't know when the mind is acting." Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so it's okay to take ourselves. In the book, I actually teach a lot of acting techniques, mm -hmm. improv techniques. Okay, I look, I, I was an actor in my 20s. I could cry on stage because I was taking myself to an emotional place. Correct. Correct. So we're being beat up. What if we took ourselves to a place where we were victorious? Mm -hmm. The body doesn't know when the mind is acting. <laughs> Bang, show up. Yeah. Now, this is a, there's a few fascinating things that you mentioned in there, Rob. Uh, sometimes I think that perfection can be, it's almost like a comfort blanket because you can't attain perfection. So it's almost like there's always a little bit more you need to do before you put yourself out there, maybe before you do the proposal or whatever. So how do you get people out of that? Because some people go, oh, well, I just want to get everything right. And, and like you said, you can't always get every single thing right. And it's actually holding you back from doing anything. Right. So the first thing we have to do is just sort of, as with anything else, we have to identify the problem. We, I think we've all learned, because so many people have written about it, including me, of the <laughs> conscious and unconscious levels of behavior. I think what we're saying right now is very rational. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, it's logical. Yeah, yeah. It's not instinctive. And so, you know, there's where instinct gets in the way of logic. 
So one of the first things we do is we have to, it's difficult when we're unconsciously incompetent. Mm -hmm. We don't know that we don't know. So the first <laughs> thing we have to do is we have to be aware that the problem exists. And that's why I, I hope many authors exist. When we, when we write things like this, I'm reminding people, I'm making you aware. Uh, I, I, I think what we've talked about so far should make sense. Sure. But the question is, you know, are we unconsciously incompetent? Did we not know that we did know? Because the second step is, oh, yeah. We, what, why would I be arguing with Rob right now? <laughs> so I think a lot of it is just kind of, that's why books, I, I'm a believer in books, or, or this one's going to be an audio book too. Right. Uh, so you don't have to read it, you can listen to it. But I like these things because what it does is it just, it pulls us out of that unconscious incompetent slot hard when we don't when we're in that kind of blissfully ignorant area sure. uh, now that i learned it i don't want to have to think about it too much i just want to do it uh, be natural that's what we're after yeah so here's one of the things that uh i have found personally throughout my career and particularly with you know running organizations or managing people or whatever that the toughest thing is self-awareness right I mean, it's a tough thing to do to learn yourself and actually become self-aware and realize there are things about yourself that you, you know, you need to correct or behaviors that maybe you're unaware of that you need to become aware of. How do you how do you help people become self-aware? Because I've always found that's the really that's the toughest thing you can do. And if you take it into the sales realm, I mean, you know, there again, you're almost multiplying the difficulty level. Right. Boy, do I love sales audiences. You know, some people fear them. I got to tell you, I love them because with a good sales audience, they got some place to be. Uh, they 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 got a commission to hit. So they will love you or hate you, but they won't stay in the middle. You better show <laughs> them value. So how do you do it? One way, and, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you that Brian Tracy is doing sure. the forward for this book. I'm so grateful, but Brian Tracy really showed me the way. Brian Tracy was the first guy that put measurements behind what he did. He put processes behind what he did. He created repeatable, predictable processes behind what he did. So one way to prove it, one way to do it is measure it. You know, they, they, they when, when you when you can measure it, you can fix it. Right. So yesterday I gave a presentation in front of, you know, some pretty skeptical people who weren't salespeople. It was my publisher and the entire <laughs> office. So measure it. I, I actually have a meter on my computer. I had them actually answer a question their way and then try to not focus on the words and focus on the emotion mm -hmm. and trust their instinct. And I kept it. I, I measured the, the actual sound level in the room with an with a, a, a actual physical measurement and showed them the level that went up. When we work with salespeople, to me, what they, what, what they should demand, I want them to demand this of me, is listen, you can entertain us, you can motivate us, you can inspire us, okay? Mm -hmm. But by golly, we want a process. We <laughs> want a, and so when you put that process in front of them, and what I've done in this book is, you know, there's some motive. I, I've tried to inspire people because it's a sensitive subject, mm -hmm. but I also want to say, bang, 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 yeah. put process behaviors that are measurable, I think when you do that, and oh, by the way, I'll try and be entertaining, <laughs> uh, you know, motivational. But when you do that, um, you satisfy that audience right. because once we have that measurement, listen, I can do it right or I can do it wrong. I just want to know. Mm -hmm. we, you know. I want to know whether I'm an unconscious incompetent. <laughs> so give me a measurement. Yeah. So what are some other things? Um, you know, what are some techniques or or uh, tactics or processes that salespeople can use to communicate better and to build credibility better with their prospects and customers? Good. OK, so let's stay on that measurement level. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing I do, and it's funny, I, I unconsciously did it with you before we started this presentation. I really only had one question for you. And my question was this. How long do you want me to go? Right. on a typical answer. Because one of the things I teach in this book, and I be believe it with salespeople, is we have to watch the length of time that we're talking, clearly. But and by good, the way, yes, I, we're going to ask a lot of questions. Yes, we're going to listen. Yeah. But there's a time where we talk. So one concept in the book that I believe in that, that's helpful is I have what I call a communication shot clock. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, in professional sports, at least in the U.S., yep. you don't have a shot clock in, in your football or soccer. No. But if you watch American sports, mm -hmm. NFL, they have so much time to get a playoff. The NBA, basketball, they have so much time to get a shot off. In baseball, which is losing fans, they're actually experimenting with a clock. You have this long to throw that pitch because <laughs> you're boring us to tears. <laughs> I think that as salespeople, we should have our own communication shot clock, mm -hmm. which says, what if we told ourselves every question that that client asks us or every point we make, we try and make in 45 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Right. Um, well, Rob, I, got, I want to tell him about five things. Well, actually, the client typically only hears wants to hear about one or two things about that. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to tell them about everybody love. If the client will ask. <laughs> they'll say can you go can you tell me how you do that Bang, yeah. 45 seconds can you the, the client won't ever ding you because you didn't answer it long enough but right. one technique is let's put a let's put a shot clock on us second is for me at least is and i i meet a lot of salespeople that you know they're very smart mm -hmm. but they kind of struggle with the tune you know not the words the tune so I actually, within the book, we talk about pitch, pace, mm -hmm. pause. Those are the three I like. I, I, and let's take the last one. Pause, for instance. It's a measurable activity. I think we get a little hyper when we're selling sometimes. <laughs> In reality, the client says to us, how would you do this? Because this is important. And we rush right in with, a, with an answer. What if we actually physically caused ourselves to pause? Mm-hmm and say, here's an answer. What if we actually worked on exercises, which I have in the book, to stretch our vocal range? I will not accept the fact that people go, well, I normally talk like this. <laughs> but how about works for me? Uh, my partner does most of the conversation. <laughs> Wait a minute, That's, you're not in some sort of prison there. There are actual <laughs> techniques that stretch us up, stretch us down, stretch. So we can actually manually work on our pitch we can actually manually work on our pace where we go quick and slow it down for key areas. And we can man manually work on our ability to pause. Yeah. And those are three techniques. Those are th a couple of areas. Just one last one, if I could. Sure. And, uh, and I nicked it in one of your questions, but it's so important to me. I want to hit it again in case I ran by it. I believe we need to get into character. In other words, Sometimes we're so encumbered with what we're taking out there, okay, that we forget client wants, the client is reading you. They're reading your eyes. They're reading your body language. So rather than get so encumbered, this is what was really working with my Petri dish of unemployed. The secret sauce for me was, yep, you've been working on the words, resumes. Yep, you've been working on your cover letter, words. Yep, you've been working on your LinkedIn site, more words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, oh, elevator pitch, more words. Throw it out for a moment. What if we get into character? Who are you? What? You know, we, Daniel Day-Lewis, one of my favorite actors. Mm -hmm. Man gets into character when he played Abe Lincoln. You had to call him Mr. President. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's who he was. What if we got into character and we said, well, who am I? I'm going to play the role of a successful salesperson. I'm going to play. What does a successful salesperson eat? What cereal do they have? Mm -hmm. What car do they drive? What, I want to immerse myself in this character. I want to understand my character. And I'm going to trust that character. And I'm going to take that character out and now ask me questions. I'm in character right now. I'm a successful author and I'm a heck of a nice guy. Am I really? <laughs> Hope so. Yeah. But that's my character. Are you, and, and that's who I'm playing yeah. and I'm comfortable with it because sometimes I don't feel so successful just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't feel like a great writer, but that's not going to work with my client. So I'll get into character. I don't just yell at myself. <laughs> I begin to think, wait a minute. First of all, let's go back to successes you've had. Let's go back to your track record. Let's go back to moments where you really nailed it with sales pop. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Now ask me a question. I don't want to carry a lot of words with me. The words are there. I become much more articulate when I'm in character. I hope yeah. that makes sense.
No, that makes fantastic sense, Rob. And actually, you prompted a bunch of questions here, and I'm just trying to just get a few. Um, the first, the first one that I think is really fascinating is when you were saying about the pause bit, because this is um, this is a kind of soapbox issue of mine. Is that uh, especially in sales or whatever, you know, people are so afraid of silence, right? Silence is the worst thing. Dead air, dead air on the phone, dead air on, on a web uh, conference or dead air in a room. You know, it's like, I've got to fill that. And we don't give ourselves time to think and we don't give the, the prospect time to think. We, we have to get away from that, right? That's why I love your thing about pausing. Yeah, and just think for a moment, what's the greatest gift a client can give a salesperson? to let them behind the curtain Correct. and tell them, this is what scares my company. This is what, this is our challenge. This is our concern. Now imagine you and I are sitting on bar stools. We just mm -hmm. had a small drink, we're, we're sober. <laughs> and you said to me, I'm gonna tell you something I don't tell other people. Mm -hmm. but this is my concern. And as you get the word concern out, I go, here's what we need to do about it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you see, uh, that pause, I'm glad you picked up on that because I know my hot buttons in this book. And I, and I, like I said, to the salesperson, it feels like I, I took a long pause. No, your, your, your syntaxes are firing up. It feels like it. You have to manually pause. You're not getting dinged for that. Take it in. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Ask them another question. That feels real. Yeah, I was going to say it really feels like you're engaged in a in a real communication, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And and the other thing that I picked up on there, um, which was really interesting, you're talking about how you show up, right? And you know, I often say this to people. It's like if somebody comes to me and says, "Ah, oh, you know, I don't normally make speeches, but I have to make one today." You know, and I'm really nervous, and I'm going to, you know, and there's all these people out there, and I say, I always say to them. Everybody in that room wants you to be great. They want you to be great. Nobody wants to watch a train wreck, right? No, nobody wants you to fail. Everybody wants you to be good, right? And, and it's the same um, in sales. When, when you're waiting for a salesperson to come in, you want, you want to be wowed. You want to be informed. You want it to be a good experience. So um, as a salesperson, you should be thinking that actually, you know, the person I'm going to see wants me to be good. They want, they, they want yeah. me to succeed. Great point, great point. And if your audience isn't believing you, I'm gonna help you a little bit, right? I help right. them. You might be going, wait a minute, why would they want, what, 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 what's their motive? <laughs> oh, the motive's very clear. The motive's very clear. When you're showing up, they, they've set out a, a time on their calendar. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have a problem they were thinking about fixing, you wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Why, logically? Why would I be rooting against you walking in? Yeah. I hope this guy comes in and really wastes my time <laughs> with a useless solution, okay? <laughs> now, for their own sense of greed, in a positive way, but their own sense of greed, they are definitely rooting for you. That goes for an audience too. Ooh, I get nervous when I speak. By the way, just a little jealous nit. I don't use the word nervous, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't let any client of my use the You can be anxious. Mm -hmm. Because I can use, anxious is good. We want that little fire in the belly. Yeah, yeah. But I'm anxious when I speak. Yep, you're right. But I'm going to take your words. Why would an audience want to root against you out of the gate? It's mm -hmm. their time you're occupying, and they want to get something out of it. Now, if we don't have the content behind us, okay, I'm going to let you be a little more anxious. <laughs> but you're bringing the goods. They're rooting for you. And let's go back to the other point. And they can identify with imperfection. Mm -hmm. So don't worry. Rob Jollis has delivered seminars for over 30 years. I've never had a perfect one yet. And quite frankly, I don't want a perfect one. <laughs> it's unidentifiable. They won't yeah. be able to identify with me. Right, right. Because then it looks rote, right? It looks like um, it doesn't look real. And it's the same in the sales context. And I think I love that idea and that image that you just created of sitting across a bar from or sitting in bar stools with your customer. Yeah, if you don't sh shut up for a few moments, you're never giving them the opportunity to tell you something surprising, right? Exactly. Um, Robin, uh, in the last few minutes here, what I'd love you to do is tell people a little bit more about yourself. But before we do that, what we always ask guests on Sales Chat is, what is the Rob Jolis a special power tip. What do you do every day to set yourself up for success? I didn't see that question coming. No, so let me think about that. Cause I'm probably, I hope 
I'm an unconscious competent, either <laughs> that or I'm unconsciously incompetent. But um, one of the things that I do is I, I, I really believe, and I want this to sound corny, it's sort of my genetic programming. It gets in the way sometimes. I really believe each day I'm going to be, it will be successful, yeah. okay? Unless I work to make it not successful. <laughs> so um, I don't, I used to believe in jinxes, for instance. Mm -hmm. I used to believe, whoa, 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 and I write about this in the book. Oh, well, don't, don't, don't tell people that this is a big day. Um, don't, don't hope for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You'll jinx it. <laughs> Show me one statistic that says rooting for something decreases our chances <laughs> of success. As a matter of fact, I can prove to you statistically that thinking positively and believing the outcome will be positive because you carry that with you now, carry that energy, people feel that I can statistically improve your chances of success by simply believing you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm sort of figuring out as I speak to you, I've mm -hmm. got to take it and make it a conscious behavior is I believe what I write, which is, I'm not jinxing myself. I even tell people I'm I'm going after this account or I've got this presentation. And I'm gonna knock them dead. Mm -hmm. I, when I, I was younger in my career, I go, don't tell people you're gonna knock them dead. What have you done? With? Uh, it, it's interesting, but if I tell them I'm gonna knock them dead, it's in my head. I'm 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 gonna better do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we gotta see ourselves successful. I really do. And um, I think we get up each day and see it that way. Even if we're improving you by two percentage points, wow. I want every point I can get. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Actually, a very wise person once said to me that, um, you know, say you have, let's say in the context of sales, say you have a big presentation coming up on Tuesday next week, right? And you're worrying about it and you're thinking, oh, if this doesn't go well, it's terrible. And what this person said to me is, the best thing you can do is think, what, what, what are you going to feel like if everything just goes fantastically and you get it, right? I want you to think like that between now and Tuesday. Now, on Tuesday, maybe it doesn't, maybe you don't get what you want. You don't get the result or whatever. But you had a good time in between. You felt good for the whole week as opposed to feeling bad, right? Yeah. And to your point, you know, you can carry that forward. Yeah. I'll give you one quote I happen to like. Um... It's in the book. I, I, I kind of stumbled in this. It's a simple one that I wrote down, but I, it was honest. And the quote is this. Disappointment is the penalty for hope. However, who wants to live a life where we don't hope? Right. So I'm going to accept the fact that I might be disappointed. And you know what? In a sense, shining a light in that dark area, let's do that. So I'm willing to accept the fact that I'll be disappointed because just like you said, there's an alternative. I don't have any hope. I don't hope for things. <laughs> yeah. uh, then I won't be so disappointed. You know what? Life, is, life has some disappointments. As my father used to say, dust yourself off, get back up and put one foot in front of the other and let's keep rolling. Yeah. But I'll, I'll accept that disappointment. Yeah, and let's face it, I mean, your 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 um, successes are that much sweeter because you've had a bunch of disappointments too. So anyway, Rob, in the last couple of moments here, um, why don't you tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can find out more about you. And uh, again, I, I'm really looking forward to this book and, uh, and I think everybody else should too. Coming out later this year, it's going to be awesome. But anyway, Rob, tell them about yourself. Thank you. Uh, well, the easiest thing is, of course, the website tells you a lot. So J-O-L-L-E-S dot com. Simple as that. Second thing I'll tell you is I'm, I'm in my ninth year of writing something I call a blarticle. And, <laughs> um, and uh, that, that I trademarked that because I really thought blog sounded kind of like I had a tuna sandwich. It was tasty. <laughs> uh, so a blarticle by legal definition is under 750 words. I have a sales audience. And uh, something, a definable tip, lesson, something in it for the reader. So um, at that website, you can sign up. It's every two weeks I'd write one. I am, I know, do not miss. I'm kind of very compulsive about that. I actually have one coming out tomorrow called The Art of the Spiel. And uh, <laughs> when we have to talk, let's do it right. But I like I like my blur article. And, and gee, I, I hope people will look out for this book because, uh, like I said, this one's personal. I think it's it's coming from a different angle. We worked on the words. Now let's work on the tune. Yeah, and I, and I think Rob, uh, I, I love the idea that you started with uh, 
you know, unemployed people and getting them back into the workforce. Because I just think that's, uh, you, I can only imagine how some of those people who have been unemployed for like five years or whatever felt when they walked in on their first day of, you know, of, of employment again. I mean, that's just, that's very heartwarming. And just before we go as well, you know, Rob does blarticles. He likes to name other things. He's got his robble heads behind him there. <laughs> Uh, the robble head absolutely yeah <laughs> all right but listen thanks rob for um for being as entertaining as always but as as really insightful and as i said i really hope people uh, pick up on the book and learn more about you um want to thank martha i would say all the way over in vienna on the other side of the city today <laughs> uh, my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeline of crm thank you for joining us for the sales chat today and thanks again to rob for making it such a great one bye 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 <laughs>